Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian. Um, I'm the developer at ThemeBoy. We make uh, themes and plugins um, for WordPress. And uh, over the past year, we've been working on a plugin called SportsPress, which is a league management tool. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking about uh, localization of themes and plugins and sort of what we've learned over the past year of developing SportsPress. And hopefully, um, some of this information will be useful to you if you're thinking of um, getting your uh, product translated as well. Um, so the first question, I guess, is why? Why should you translate uh, your product? Because statistics. Over half the websites are in English. So that's a good thing, right? No problem there. But only 27% of Internet users speak English as their first language. So there's obviously an imbalance between the number of websites and the number of internet users for a particular language. Because you care. Can anyone read that? Good. <laughs> um, providing a translation in another language lets people of that language, uh, uh, it lets them know that you actually care about um, giving them the tools that they need in their language. Because English is not everyone's first language, and a lot of people don't even speak English. And because money. There was a study called Can't Read, Won't Buy, which um, came out with the statistics that 72% of uh, Internet shoppers prefer to buy in their own language, and 55% won't even consider buying in another language. So you're losing out on a lot of business if you're not offering uh, your website in other languages, potentially. I like to talk about how languages are different from English in particular and why that really matters. So you don't have to learn another language to be able to code uh, using localization techniques. I just want to tell you how languages are different so that you can uh, make considerations when you actually write your code. The first thing is pretty obvious, but word length. Now, some words that might be short in English might be much longer in other languages. For example, the word butterfly. That translates to one character in Chinese. And in German, a lot more. So if you're designing a button, it probably wouldn't say butterfly, but if it says something uh, in English, you want to make sure that you use the proper styling to make sure that your uh, button can fit any length of characters, or at least any reasonable length of characters. So the solution is CSS. And definitely don't bake text onto your images. Um, localization shouldn't be the reason why you're not doing that, but uh, it's still a good reason. Now, some languages, especially Romance languages, have genders assigned to objects, inanimate objects, not just people. And that's important because let's say you have the string add new event. I can't read that, but the word in the middle is nov, which means new. And if you're adding a new team, in English, it's still add new but you could see that there's an extra character that shows that that object is a uh, female. And obviously there's another version, and uh, that extra character um, tells us that the object is uh, plural or neutral in gender. So there's a couple different ways to go about this. Obviously the more efficient way is to use the printf function which takes in um, a string with a placeholder, that's that percent %s in the middle, and replaces it with another string. So this works uh, for English and a lot of languages, but it doesn't work for Romance languages because of that gender issue. So the more accurate way to do that is to actually physically add uh, the string using the standard functions. Um, with SportsPress, the technique that I've used is to use the more efficient strings for um, admin-only uh, words, because 
we're going to have a lot of words if we start adding strings for every single action that you can do in the admin. And for um, front end, front facing words, we tried to go with the more accurate uh, method. So not all languages are read left to right. For example, Arabic and Hebrew are read right to left. And this is not just the direction of text. It's the direction of information as well. Which means that if you've got your logo in the top left corner, as you traditionally would, it should be in the top right corner. It's the first thing you want your visitors to read, not some contact us button or whatever's on the top uh, right of your screen usually. And the way to fix this is to create an RTL style sheet, which basically um, replaces all float rights with float lefts, all text rights with text lefts, and anything else that could be affecting uh, your website layout. Here's a function that you can um, use to load the RTL style sheet, and that's just a WordPress function, isRTL, which returns true if you're viewing it in Arabic, Hebrew, or another RTL language. So just include that in your functions or uh, your plugin uh, file. So a great tool that I discovered as I was working on SportsPress is called TransFX. Um, TransFX is a localization platform. It's web-based. And it's a lot like PoEdit, uh, but it allows for people to um, open source translations and contributors to join your project and just add translations in their language when they feel like it. And another tool that you might be familiar with if you're working with translations is Poedit, which is an, um, available on, I think, poedit.net. So the first thing you want to do is add these two lines of code, or one or the other, depending on if you're working with a theme or a plugin. Um, that just tells WordPress to load the strings in uh, the language that's currently being viewed. So that's one for themes and one for plugins, obviously. And you also want to change the WordPress language um, by finding this define WP Lang, and usually that's left blank if you installed in English. And you've just got to replace that with the uh, locale that you're using. So in that case, that's uh, Braz Brazilian Portuguese. There's a few get text functions. Uh, I think Anthony's going to go over these um, in his talk as well, so I'm just going to quickly uh, run over them. So that's the first one's a double underscore, which just returns a translation. Um, the next one echoes it, so it's the same as actually going echo, double underscore. And you've got the printf, which I uh, showed you earlier, um, which is a placeholder function. And the underscore n, which, takes in pl um, which calculates whether or not uh, this count number is plural or singular and returns um, the appropriate string. And we've also got context, uh, contextual strings for disambiguation. You're also going to have to create a pop file using Poedit, which is probably the easiest way to do this. So um, at some point, you're going to have to uh, define the source keywords. And this list, I don't know if it's extensive, but it's pretty much um, any of the uh, functions that you'll be using. So if you go ahead and just put the, all those into the source keywords, you should be all right. It should uh, uh, find all the, all the strings in your code. And make sure that you use um, core locales. Um, that's what you saw earlier, the PT underscore BR, which tells you that it's the Portuguese, uh, so the Brazilian version of Portuguese as opposed to PT underscore PT. Um, and you can actually find all of the uh, core locales at this GitHub um, project that I've put up, which basically just has WordPress core um, translation files in every language that I could find. And one technique we used with SportsPress was to use core strings as well. So that means that if you're adding a new string to your um, code, every time you add a new string, uh, everyone's got to translate that one string into their language. Where, right now, I think we have 55 languages, which means that each string uh, creates 55 tasks for your translators, which is a lot of time, and it could add up. What we've tried to do, whenever possible, is to find a string that exists in core already and use that, or use a synonym if it's appropriate. So you're going to have to actually look into um, the core translations and see if the string will fit. I'm going to get into a little bit of code. Um, there is a Python script for TransFX, 
which is really useful for saving time and updating your translations automatically. If you're interested in doing that, just a quick line to get pip, which is the, uh, uh, what was <laughs> the package installation manager for Python. So that's just python get pip.py. And then install the transifex client, which is just a simple line of code there as well. And once you've done that, you can cd into your directory and go tx init, which initializes it. And go ahead in your config file, which will generally be blank except for the first two lines. So you're going to have to go and add these four lines and obviously change project slug and resource slug to yours um, and the other ones as well so that it all matches. And that basically tells Transifex um, what, strings, oh, sorry, what files to replace when you do the updates. So you can push your source strings, just tx push dash s. Um, and that's, that pushes your strings to the Transifex servers and updates all the source, transla sorry, source strings so that your translators can see what you've changed and what they need to work on. And you can also pull translations. Sometimes you just want to pull it from one language. That's pulling it from Japanese, tx pull dash l j a. Or pull all translations. We usually do that right before we launch a major update. WordPress uses uh, GNU get text library, which you can download and install. This actually takes a little while, probably 10 to 20 minutes once it uh, gets going. But by using that, you, you can actually compile all your PO files into MO files programmatically without actually going into a PoEdit or something and saving it every time. So we run this command every, every time we run an update, which goes through all 55 translations, creates the machine-readable MO files. And that saves us a lot of time whenever we're um, trying to update all the translations. So just a quick recap of what I've gone over. Why? Because statistics. Because there's an imbalance. There are way too many English sites, which is not a bad thing, but there aren't enough sites in other languages. And obviously that puts you at an advantage if you do translate your content. Because you care. Because translating your content into another language tells those people that you care about their business. And because money. Everyone wants to make money. And you're doing this um, so that you can, you're, you want to make money so that you, you can continue to do what you love and you don't have to, uh, you know, become a baker or something. Which is fine, but. Okay, how languages are different. Think about word length. Make sure that your words don't cut off the screen. Think about gender. Objects in some languages have different genders. And think about right to left. Change your style sheets. Add that right to left style sheet because Arabic and Hebrew and other languages um, are um, a big portion of uh, your users. And use Poedit to get started with your translations. Use Transifex to open source those translations or contribute your language if you do speak another language. And use WordPress core to uh, get those basic translations, basic strings for your project so that you can save a lot of time for you and your translators. So I'd like to wrap it up and uh, take any questions if you've got them. Um, so I only speak English and Japanese, so I've done the Japanese translations, but for the other ones, I've actually just put the project up on Transifex and um, sort of started off the languages, which actually by using core languages, uh, the core strings and um, strings from some other plugins, it populates about 55% of our translations, um, which I think is about 630 strings. So the remaining uh, 300 are done by um, native translators. Uh, on Transifex, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. When you have to translate it, so it will take some years, or have, is there a marketplace for that? Or? Um, so the question is, uh, how do you source translators, and is there a marketplace? Um, 
The translators actually just, usually actually they're um, users of our plugin. So um, we've got a link in the plugin description page that sort of uh, tells people, you know, hey, if, you're if you speak another language, come and help us translate this thing. And that's how a lot of people find us. Um, I think another way people find us is through the search engine on TransFX. But basically, these are all users of TransFX that have signed up to help other people with translation. Similar to, it's just an open source community for translations, basically. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, uh, the question was, um, with uh, SportsPress, our plugin, do we know the sort of the language breakdown, percentage of users per language? Um, it's actually really hard to tell with SportsPress itself because that's uh, hosted on the WordPress repository, and we do sort of get limited um, data from that. But before this, we were selling a uh, theme for sports, which is a, sort of a similar thing. And with that, we were seeing a little over half, about 60% of English speakers, and the other 40 were from um, other countries in Europe, South America, and Africa, and other areas where English wasn't their first language. So it is a pretty big percentage, and I think one of the reasons it was a big percentage for us was because we actually did translate uh, that theme as well into other languages. Yes, Steve. That's a good question. Um, so uh, the question was, is, is there a way that we're vetting the translations coming in from TransFX um, to make sure that you know they're not, I guess, inappropriate or, or incorrect? Um, so with TransFX, there are three different types of roles per language, and you could actually create teams, which is what we do. Um, usually, we are the coordinators, just being the plugin developers, and there are reviewers and translators. When someone joins your project, they're automatically a translator. And if you see quality translations coming out of them, if you release that code and no one's complained, and some, some languages we've got four or five translators. So I usually promote one or two of them to be a reviewer. Um, and they've got this nice little interface that kind of has two different colors of, for the reviewed um, translations and for the unreviewed translations. Um, so that's sort of the way that we do that. Um, yeah, so sports press is uh, like a league management tool. Um, basically, what we, we used to have a theme. Um, we still do, but it's uh, for creating your own website for like a sports team, soccer team or footy team or whatever it is. And sports press basically takes the functionality out of that um, as its own plugin. And we decided to give that functionality on WordPress and actually um, sell the themes separately um, so that more people can just use the functionality and use whatever theme they want. Um, so it sort of creates teams, players, profiles, league tables, um, event schedules, and things like that. Okay. Thanks for your question. Right. Yeah. Next awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Hi everyone, my name's James. Uh, if I faint, it's probably because I'm a bit nervous. I'm filled up with Sudafed and I'm trying to suck my stomach in because of the camera. Uh, Aaron contacted me last week and asked me to do a presentation. I really didn't know what to do. So I sort of started putting together something. Uh, myself and Aaron have spoken before about Grunt. And I've been using Grunt a bit with WordPress. I've worked with WordPress for probably about five years. Um, I'm one half of a small agency. We do a lot of bespoke web development, so everything I do today is sort of within my own development. We don't sell themes and stuff like that. We just basically build bespoke websites and custom themes for those companies. Um, I'm hoping, if all goes right, I've got a little bit of a demonstration, and hopefully it works. But uh, I want to sh Does anyone actually use Grunt at this moment in time? Oh, there's a few of you. You might want to sh switch off for 20 minutes. And the others might actually end up switching off as well by the time I'm through. All right, so for those of you that don't know, um, 
Grunt is basically uh, it's a JavaScript task runner. Um, what it does, it uses a, a number of plugins which are installed via the NPM or Node package modules and Node JavaScript package manager. Uh, the reason sort of you would use it is it just automates a lot of laborious and monotonous tasks. So it's something that actually sits there in the background and there's a bunch of plugins you can use. The bulk of stuff sort of, and I'll show you some examples later, but the bulk of stuff I've got it doing is, you know, collating JavaScript, CSS, minifying it, pulling in packages using Bower and things like that. So one of the great things for it is it really does speed up your workflow and your development. And look, you can always find out more at gruntjs.com. I know, and I'm not talking about this today, but I know that some people have whole setups where you can set up a theme and use Grunt and you can basically pull something straight off of GitHub and it will basically create your entire framework for you. So if you're using something like a Bootstrap or Foundation, it, it, it's a great tool because you can just go and grab all that stuff without having to worry too much. Okay, so what is Bower? Bower is simply, it's, it's a package manager. Uh, and what this does is it just, goes and fetches various packages on the web, and by packages what I'm talking about is again those sort of frameworks, um, JavaScript plugins, CSS plugins, anything, like Font Awesome, for instance, things like anything. Look, basically, if it's on GitHub, Bower can go and get it. And what it's gonna do for you is it's gonna pull the latest version or a version you need to use. So again, if you, you know, I will not lie, I am the king of copy and paste. If you do that a lot, you can use this to basically come and grab everything and put it in. And what I'll show in the demonstration is the way you, you can actually use Bower to sort of, if you've got a consistent number of plugins and things you use, you might not use them in every project, but what you can use with Bower is you can pull them all in and then you can cherry pick what you want to use depending on your project. And again, it speeds up workflow and you can find out more at bower.io. So, <coughs> excuse me, getting started. Um, first step really is, it does run on Node.js, so you need to go and get that. Um, you can basically go to their website. They have a great big whopping green button that says download on it. Um, if you fail that, I would probably quit doing what you're doing and uh, move on to a new career. And again, if you want to use Bower, you need to install Git. And again, if you go to the Git address there, you can go and they've got a great big button that says download again, so you can't go wrong. So step two, look, you're going to have to sort of get familiar and comfortable with working in command line. Um, I'll be brutally honest, it's not something that I was particularly comfortable with and I'm not a command line guru and don't really know a lot of the time what I'm doing. But with these two things, it's actually very easy and so far I've not destroyed anything and that's been a few months, so no months of destroying anything is always good in my eye. Uh, and then step three, what you would do is you would um, basically open up your command line. I've got a Max, it's terminal. I've got no idea what it is on a Windows machine. Does anyone know? Anyone? No, okay, we move on. And you simply tump, uh, type in the things down the bottom. So npn install, g, grunt, blah, blah, and install Bower. And what that's going to do is that's actually going to put it on your computer. It's going to allow you to use those package managers. So the way that Grunt works is it actually works on a pro per project basis. Um, you need two files. The first file what you need to create is a package uh, JSON file. And you would simply just drop that into your theme folder and what it's going to do is that's going to hold all the plugin information. So all of those NPM plugins that you're pulling from Grunt that's going to allow you to do your things, you're going to have to put the information for them in this or as you if you install them manually, it's going to actually add them to it. And what you simply do is we've got name, give it a project name, give it a version number, and that is pretty much the basis of it. Then what you want to do straight away is you want to install the latest version of Grunt, and that's what you would do down the bottom. If you install that, and that is going to add the latest version of Grunt to your project. And I, look at this, I put together a video. This, how do I work this though? So CD, I've dragged it in my theme folder. That's just my example. Yep, and that's what I'm talking to now. npn install Grunt, and away we go. Ignore the warnings. And I'm going to speed this. Oh, there you go. So it's installed. So it's all done. And that's basically what we're looking at. So at that point, what we have is your package JSON file would have updated. And as you'll see, it's added grunt to the developer dependencies there. As you're adding more plugins to it, and I'll show you an example in a minute because I am I'm probably rushing through this a bit, so I apologise. You would 
simply just npm install and put in the plugin name. And you can find these plugins from the Grunt website itself. So you would go there and look at the plugins, do a search for what you're after. I mean, look, you know, just use Google and type in Grunt and CSS minification, you'll find loads of them as well. What you'll do is once you've seen them, or once you've added this file, it will, you can either add it as a per project, or if you do this with the double dash save dash dev, what it will do is it will actually keep a copy of that constantly in that package JSON file. And the great thing about this is once you've set it up once, you can essentially just take it from project to project. Because there's no master file, it is a per project application, you can simply copy and paste it into another project and just run the same installation again and it will do it all. So, what you would do at this point, I have got another video. So going through that, I'm just linking to the folder again. You don't need to do this every time. I think I did this because I probably recorded the video at different times. And now I'm going to install, or just do my NPN install, which is going to pull in all my plugins. And I'm going to whiz through this because it goes forever. And what it will do is it will just come through and it will say successful, 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 successful. And there it is. And now at that point, and excuse me, what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with a folder like this. So this would be my theme folder. And you're, what it will do is... Am I stepping on the cord? That cool? Um, it adds this folder node modules. And as you can see, it's got all of the different packages that I've asked it to install as per my... That's the bow one, sorry. As per that. So that's not very clear, I apologise. Let me just... So as you can see, that would be the package JSON file that I've got in there. And they're all the different things I'm pulling. Um, typically where you can see sort of the semicolons and the asterisks, you could put a version number in there, but I'm really lazy, and I just want it to pull the latest version. So I just leave the asterisks in there, and it will just grab whatever's the newest one. So... Oh, far out. Okay, so what we now need to do, that's great. So now what we've got in our theme is we have all of the, sort of the modules we want to call through Grunt to use, but they're actually not going to do anything. What we need to do is we need to create a, a Grunt JS file. And what that's going to do is that's actually going to tell grunt itself or the uh, command line what to do with those packages when we want them. So this is like a very, very basic setup. And as you can see at the top, you've got obviously just the code you need with your module exports. You've got your config bit, and then you've got the package we're calling, which is obviously package.json. We would then add the plugin tasks here. And then down the bottom, we have to load the plugin that provides the task. And then default is basically the the command that we're going to run, or grunt in this case, to actually make all those plugins run. Um, in regards to the loading the tasks that, with the plugin name, so, sorry, I have to, this one here, there is a great little plugin that can actually eliminate you having to manually put that in every time. Because if you had like 12 of them, you're supposed to put in 12, but there is a, a plugin, and I'll show you in my file what that is. So you download that, install it, and that will actually take that away from you. But the default tasks down the bottom, you can divide this up however you want it to do. If you want to just run everything at once, you can leave it at default. If you want to have a custom task that only does something once, you can do that as well. And again, I've, I've got a demonstration. Hopefully it works, and it will make some sense. I really hope this is making sense. So, so I'm just going to escape and go back. So at this point, you would have, ignore that file, bow file, I'm afraid. So you'd have your grunt file, your modules, and your package JSON file. So just to give you an example on a grunt file, we're looking at something like that. That one at the very top, load grunt tasks, dev de dependencies, that's a little plugin that, uh, that's the plugin that I was talking about. That basically, you put that in at the very top, that avoids you having to do all that other manual input at the bottom. So these are just the tasks, and I'll skip, I will go through them. And then you can see there all the different tasks, and then at the bottom, you can see what I'm, when I want to tell Grunt to do things. And you can see I've just put a few different ones in there as examples. Now, if you just wanted to use just Grunt, you can go ahead and do that. That's fine. Grunt doesn't need Bower to run, and they're not, they're, it's not the same. Bower is just basically 
an add-on that I like to use or a <coughs> resource that I use Grunt to process. But you could actually, if you really wanted to, you could go away now and just use Grunt and do whatever you want with your site unification, things like that. But I wanted to include a bit with Bower as well. So Bower, or setting up Bower, it, look, it's very similar to what you're doing with Grunt, basically. You've got to go back in the command line. You need to create this time, instead of obviously package JSON, you need a Bower JSON file. Uh, you simply do what I did before. You open up your terminal, CD, drag your theme folder into it, return, and then Bower in it. And what that's going to do is that's going to create that JSON file, and it's going to throw you a load of different options. And that really, they're things like whether you want it private and what you want to ignore because it's on Git. To be brutally honest, you just press yes half the time and it will do everything for you. I mean, I, it, as I said, I don't read the documentation. Uh, and then exactly the same principle, you add packages as required. So you would just go to the Bower website, you can look at the packages there, it gives you the address. Pretty much the way I work most of the time is, look, if it's on GitHub, you can pretty much grab it with Bower. Um, what I'm doing really is you can either manually go into the terminal every time and type in your Bower install, whatever the package name is in GitHub, and save. If you want to keep it all the time, or we'll save devs. Uh, or if you already know the names of them, you can just go there and type them all in yourself. Um, again, the great thing about this is once it's set up, it, 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 it's exclusive to the project it's in. So once you've got, if you've got a really good setup and you like your setup, it's, you're not recreating the wheel every time. You just have to move this file into your new folder for your new theme. You just take it all with you, just run the command again in the command line, and away you go. So just to give you an example, so a Bower JSON file is going to look something like this. So I've got my name, I've got my version, I've got my author, which is me, I've given it a description. These are all the options that, that sort of get created as you're going through that phase. And then you can see I've got some dependencies there, and then I've just thrown in a load of random uh, JavaScript plugins, some other things. I think what we got, we've got slider, lightbox, scroll to, animate. Font Awesome in there. Yeah, Font Awesome's there. So you just basically grab the packages that you think, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use in that, in that process. But, okay, so I'm going to try and run a demonstration and I'm hoping it works. I apologise if it doesn't already. So, um, as I showed you with my grunt file JavaScript, um, basically... But I was first talking about that will load my dependencies great, but the first thing I sort of want to do is I, I really need to install those Bower components. So what I've set up is this is a, a Grunt NBM plugin, which is Bower install simple. And what I'm doing is I'm going to go off and I'm going to grab all those things I've outlined in my Bower uh, file and I'm going to put them in a Bower components folder. And down the bottom, I've put this in as a unique task. So, and that's just, so I'm going to run that at the first time. So we'll just concentrate on that at the moment. I've put this in nice and big. So hopefully, is that visible enough? All right. Please work. All right, so there we go result. I actually look like I know what I'm talking about. So, as you can see, what it's done is it's gone through to get, it's grabbed everything I've wanted, it's installed it, and what it's done in my theme folder is it's created this folder called Bower Components, where it's put them all in there. Now, what you can do is you can actually manually move things from here if you want, but it's like, I, I sort of like to try and keep all those components separate to the ones I might work on, because I don't want to, if I, if I edit any of these files or mess with them, I don't really want to mess with the ones that I'm pulling from Bower, because I want to, if I ever need to in the next project, I just want to come and grab the next one. I don't necessarily want to mess with the files that I'm getting from GitHub. So, what I do as one of my grunt tasks is, I now want to put my Bower components where I want them. So what I'm doing is, in all of those packages I've downloaded, I'm moving the, the JavaScript files to folder called JS in the libraries. I want to move the CSS files to the CSS. I want to move SAS files to the CSS. And then what I'm doing with certain things is, because, and this is a bit of a problem you find, is there's no sort of universal way that people package their plugins. So 
you typically find that some people will be, do really annoying things like put their images in a CSS folder or their JavaScript folder on certain plugins and you don't want to pull all that garbage and put it in that library folder. So generally, typically what I do is I tell it to ignore images and in this instance I've just put in more jQuery because I don't really want to bother putting it. What you also find is obviously certain packages, you can specify what we call package specific. So on font awesome, I'm going to move the fonts into a new folder called fonts and I want to move the CSS into my CSS folder and just with the name, or well, that's the link, and I'm going to put it in my fonts in my CSS folder. Um, what I've found with some of these things, and if you, if you do this, if, if, those of you who are already doing this sort of thing, you'll, learn, you'll already witness this, is because people put things all over the place in their packages, it's not intelligent enough every time to work out exactly where everything is. So sometimes what happens is you go to install a package and you realise it's not pulling anything you want, but sometimes you have to override it, and that's what this package-specific information allows you to do. And the, other, the last two, sort of what I've done is I've just thrown in these as examples. So I've, you know, box BX slider. I'm going to, I want to take the image files and I'm going to create an image folder and I'm going to do the same with uh, Lightbox. So I'm going to take the images and as you can see, this is where the problem comes up because they keep their images in an annoying folder called themes default. And that star just tells it to take everything in that and that's going to do my images. So that is another task. So what I would do is I would go back to my terminal and this time I'm going to type grunt and I've set this up as Bower copy. And now you can see it does it all pretty quick. It's copied my file. So if we go back to my theme, you can now see all that stuff's been moved. So it's created the folders for me. Um, in CSS folder, you can see it's taken font. Awesome, that's a fantastically named default by someone. Legend, brilliant CSS file that is. Animate. Um, JavaScript has created my libraries folder and it's placed them all in there. And you can see my fonts as well. So it's taken font awesome, it's taken those fonts. So basically, it's, you know, in one simple command, it's starting to build up my framework. And I won't show you the images because this is getting quite boring. So that pretty much takes my things and it's building up my theme now with my packages that I want to use. Let's put them where I want to use them in my theme. So now what I want to do really with Grunt is... As I said before, I really only use it to manage my CSS, my JavaScript, and minify my images. So what you can do is resource packages. This is, a, this is a great one, this banner one. I cannot remember what it's called, so I apologise. But I will, I will just put all these files up somewhere that you can put for some of the people to grab. But, you know, as we all know, with WordPress, uh, when you minify anything, if you want to try and take out all the comments, it's going to cause a problem with WordPress because we need that information at the top of the staff CSS file. So... This, I put this in and that's going to create it. As you can see, I'm calling some certain things here, which is like my package name and my home page, and that is simply calling information that I've set up on that package <coughs> JSON file. So if you're doing a new project, you just simply have to change the name of that file and it will pull through. What you'll see here now is I've got my SAS plugin. It's going to combine my SAS. And what it's going to do is anything in that SCSS folder so as I build my website and I build those files up, it's just going to compress them in the end and stick them in CSS as master. Got CSS. What I'm then going to do is this is going to process the minification of that and it's going to add my banner. And what it's going to do is it's going to create our style and it's going to take my master file and it's going to take my, the font, and I've just put font awesome in as an example. So it's going to take font awesome as well, which we've already got, and it's going to create my, that master CSS file. This little plug in here is a good one auto prefix, it just saves you time, it just adds on your CSS all the browser specific um, names at the front of it, so if you're doing like border radius, you just in your CSS, you only need to put in border radius, you don't have to do all the other versions and this will go through, I've got this to go, this is going to go through my style file and it's just going to basically replace it but it's going to add on any CSS3 thing, it's going to add any necessary, I uh, can't think of the terminology now, but whatever it tells it to identify that browser. And I've set it to be last two versions, and that's basically of Chrome, or WebKit, and I think Firefox, or whatever it is, WebKit and uh, the other one. And then different versions of IE and stuff like that. So that's going to process my CSS. And then here's my JavaScript one. I, I put all my functions for my scripts in a functions file, which I'm just going to, I will create as I'm developing the project. And it's exactly the same process before. I want, I want to combine them. So, for instance, you could essentially set this up on the combine here underneath to say, okay, take everything from my JavaScript folder 
and compress it into one file. But uh, you know, uh, when you start comp- joining JavaScript files up together, they have a tendency to like a certain order with some of them. So I just use it like this because it gives me greater control. If I need one to be at the end, because I know it's going to work that way, I'm not going to spend waste hours of my time trying to work out why it doesn't work when it's position third. I do it this way and I'll put it at the bottom. And what that's going to do is that's going to produce a script file. And then my final thing is I'm going to minify those script files. And this minification file is what I'll be calling in my function in my WordPress theme. And there's modernizer as well, which I'm going to minify and just call in my function file. I'll I'll skip this because it's quick. This is just image compression stuff that you can do. Again, all my images that I've pulled in are in that folder, and I can do that for PNG, JPEGs, GIFs, GIFs, whatever you want to call it. And then I've got one for SVG as well. And then finally, and this is probably more important than anything else, is every time you, every time you make an update, essentially if you don't have this last bit, this is a watch plugin, you're going to have to go back to the command line and type grunt every time because it's not going to update. But with the watch plugin, what it's going to do is it's going to look at my files. So as I'm updating these files in my theme, it's going to automatically regenerate the end result. So what I'm doing is I'm combining my SAS and those packaged CSS files to create style CSS. I don't want to keep going back to the terminal and typing grunt every time. So this thing here, if I go into a package and I make a change, it's going to automatically recreate that file for me. And I'll show you in a minute. So this is pretty much it. You can do some stuff with this as well, the watch tool where you can, I'm calling PHP, I'm not really doing anything with it, but you can actually get it to uh, reload your, your browser. Uh, there is, I can't remember the web page, I'm really sorry. But there's, you put something in your uh, WordPress functions file and as you're developing, as you make any updates, it's going to refresh your browser at the same time as well. So going through all this, as you can see, I put them in the default at the bottom. And to be pretty nice, You could put all of these in the default because it's only running a process. So the default is simply grunt. And we're going to press return. And this is going to finish it off. Let's hope it works. So there you go. So you can see it's running through my files. And you can see it's created the JavaScript file. It's created my style CSS. And you can see how it's minified it. And it's then redone it with the audit. And there's minified 10 images in that folder. And it's done it. And now at the bottom it's saying waiting. And that's because watch has taken effect. And now it's just waiting to see any changes. So if we go back to the theme, you can now see in my JS folder it's created that scripts file. It's created my modernizer minification file. And more importantly, it's created my style CSS. And as you can see, what it's done is it's minified that, but it's kept. That, pack, that banner that I've asked and it's pulled the thing and you can see where it's added some things and what you'll see though and this is a bit of a problem but there's a way around it and just this will be the last thing I do you sort of see the problem we've got now obviously with that file is this it's calling font awesome and it's bringing that file over and it's doing that which is no good in our style CSS so what I'm going to do now is if I went back into it and said, okay, I know I need to update that. I'm going to... Do, 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 I never remember. What is it? So, yeah, I just want to find all of them and I want to replace it with nothing. So I'm going to replace all. So if we keep an eye on the terminal, which says it's waiting, if this works, when I save that, you'll see the terminal then goes through and it's just done it all straight away for me again. So if we go back and open our style file, you'll see that it's now removed. So it's a really, really quick way of doing that. And you really just, once it's set up and it's rolling, you just work your way through your theme and it will just keep working its way through and processing what you need it to process. So um, it cuts down a lot of stuff. And the great thing is, as I said, once you've set this up once, you could take this set up and you can just copy and paste and drop it into another theme. It doesn't, it's, it's a, once you're set up and rolling, you're rolling. So... That is pretty much it. Some questions, and I really hope that made sense. Right. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Stunned silence isn't a good sign. Okay. Uh, the WordPress people, so is that a way to write like general without 
yeah, you don't need to put that, that. Basically, what it will do is it will go through anything that's CSS3 that typically, like a border radius, something which typically is going to want uh, sort of the auto fix in front of it, and it's just going to add that. And you can specify what you want it to add it on. I mean, look, to be brutal, I'm no genius. Most of this stuff, you know, hey, look, you go on Google and some other genius has done it before you, yeah. you know, and you, you get it to work for yourself. But look, it just, it's, it, all of, the whole thing is just saving you time, to be honest. I mean, it's, look, it's, it was, a, a, it was a fair effort to get to sort of understand what it does. Um, you know, a lot, it's a lot of playing around, but once you've done it, you're like, yeah, this is great. I can use this whenever I want now. And like, you know, if, if, if look, you know, if, you, if you're a big bootstrap user, I say if you're using a framework, you know, I know that like Foundation have like a WordPress theme and things like that. You can use Bower to go grab that entire theme plus all the other things you might want to add to it. You just type grunt and go, and away you go, and you're off, you're off and running. So, you know, it can t you know, we're talking seconds, really. So it's a, it's a really good setup. It just takes a bit of time, you know, to get your head around it, I suppose. Oh, no worries, no questions. Bad sign. <laughs> Oh, look, look, to be honest, I haven't done that yet. Because I, because I build my own, because we have our own framework, I'll be pretty honest, I just copy and paste what I've got. So I'm just building as I go along. All, all I'm still using at the moment is just to um, do like, um, just to set up that basis of what I know I'm going to need or what I typically use. And that's why I combi you combine the JavaScript on my own because typically I just want to throw everything in there. I don't want to, ch and then I'll cherry pick through my grunt file what I use rather than, worrying about setting it all up and having different package files, so to speak. I'm just curious when you actually like package the, the finished uh, schema and you want to put it up on your server, yeah. um, do, do you go and just, remove everything? Just leave it all out. You can use some, there are packages that do clean, that will clean it for you. I don't trust anything like that because God forbid it gets rid of it. I wouldn't have to. So I basically like, you know, the, I've been playing around with a little zip package, but I can't seem to get it to work. And the zip package will supposedly ignore them. But to be honest, if I'm going to do it, I will, as sad as it sounds, I will just use the shift button and just select, select all and then unselect the, the package files and obviously those components because I don't need them to come. They can stay locally. You can set it up with Git where you can actually just push that and ignore those files as well. So you can do it that way. I mean, there's lots of ways that you can work around it, but yeah, I just, you just leave them locally. No Thank you very much. No worries. Hey, going. A um, lot of you probably already know me. Uh, my name's Anthony. Too many phones. I'm just going to talk to you tonight about some more translation stuff. I know um, Brian went through a good demonstration earlier with what he was doing with uh, his theme and plugins. Um, Basically, I want to mainly talk to you about, I'll talk to you a little bit about the, what you can do on the development side of things, but also um, how you can actually crack like a multilingual site using a great plugin called WPML. A um, little bit about me, basically I'm a designer slash developer. I run my own business, Medicine Designs. Um, I also help set up or run these meetups here and um, one, of the, one of the organisers. Um, I created a WordPress manual called EasyWP Guide, which is quite popular, um, and also helped organise the WordCamp from last year. Oh, sorry, 2013. Oh, that is last year. What am I talking about? Um, how many people here actually have a, do, or does anyone here have a, actually have a multilingual site or have even a, a site in a, another language other than English? You got, you, you got one or you're building one? I've built one in the past. Okay, okay. And I know that these two guys have. Awesome. That's three out of <laughs> 50 people. Um, as Brian said earlier, he gave you some statistics um, in regards to you know, the usage of um, people using other languages out there compared to English and uh, you know, the number of sites that are actually English. Back in May was actually the first time ever that 
the non-English downloads surpassed the English downloads of WordPress. So I think you're, I think you're going to find from now on there's going to be a lot more emphasis on creating or a lot more emphasis on creating and setting up multilingual sites and providing support for that. Um, with WordPress 4.0, which is coming out, well, it's supposed to be coming out sort of at the end of August, um, I know they've done a lot of work in the multilingual sort of side of that and helping to improve, improve that and make it a little bit easier to use. One of the things you'll find with, when you start installing Word, WordPress from 4.0 onwards, now you actually get the choice when the, one of the first little dialogues that pops up is actually one that actually asks you that, well, what language you want to install your WordPress in. If you select something like French, for example, then obviously the rest of the install process and also when you actually install it, the dashboard and everything will then be in French. Um, previously, you didn't get these choices. Uh, you had to actually go into uh, your WP, WP config file and set the WP lang variable. Uh, obviously, if you're installing using another language, once you get into actual the dashboard itself, then it's obviously in that language as well. Um, that's just French. One of the good things that they're incorporating in uh, WordPress 4 is there's, they're adding a new uh, language field into the general settings page that makes it a little bit easier to change your language. This is, um, this is running on the beta version, so it may change slightly, but I wouldn't imagine too much. But basically, uh, when I installed this, I installed the French version. Uh, in that language field that you see down at the bottom of the screen there, it gave me the choices, or gave me the choices of French and US English. So basically, I could change from French back to the US English version. To get the other languages in there, Germany or German, sorry, and Spanish, uh, I had to actually download the .po and .mo files, and then add them into a languages folder within your WP content folder. Uh, so it's still, it looks like there's still a little bit of a, a manual sort of process of changing all your language or changing the actual language within your dashboard and stuff, but it's they've taken that an extra step, I suppose. You don't have to worry about changing your WP config file, which makes it a little bit easier. And as I said, once you've got the PO and MO files in there, the language files, you can basically just select it in the language drop down. Again, I know, I know Brian sort of mentioned this earlier, um, talked about it briefly earlier. When you're, if you're developing a theme, there's basically about half a dozen different uh, functions you can use to help translate all your texts within, within your function. The main one you'll find, or the main one you'll use, is this one, basically two underscores. All it simply does is basically returns, the tran returns that text that you pass as a, as a trans translated text. You've got underscore E, basically the same as underscore underscore function, but instead of returning a value, so for example, you wouldn't, re it's not returning it to say a PHP variable or something, um, it actually echoes it out to the screen. There's underscore N, which allows you to provide a singular and a plural string you basically pass it this number variable and it'll check, it'll say if, it's, if the number is one, then it'll use the singular string. If the number is greater than one, then it'll use the plural string. Um, it's useful for things like, say for example, like I've got the example there, um, where you're displaying comments, for example, where you, where you want to display different text depending on whether it's multiple or whether it's one. For example, you might display something like that. there is a comment or there is one comment. Um, whereas if there's multiple, you say, yeah, there are comments with a plural S or on the end. Uh, we have underscore X. Underscore X allows you to provide context with regards to the, uh, the translation. So in, when you're creating a theme, quite often, or, well, not, sorry, not quite often, but occasionally you'll come across uh, strings that are exactly the same, but yeah, slightly different meanings. That 
dollar context variable that you pass it. It's basically just a, a small description to help with when people are translating so they know which way they, or the type of text that they need to add in. Again, underscore EX, same as underscore X, but all it does is echo it out to the screen rather than returning a variable. And last one is underscore NX. It's basically a hybrid between underscore N and underscore X. It allows you to provide singular and plural strings, plus you can also provide the context as well. <coughs> WPML, <coughs> excuse me, uh, WPML is a great plugin for actually being able to, or allowing you to translate your actual content within your site. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, you can provide, uh, you can basically provide your site in over 40 different languages. Uh, it, there's handy tools for your um, for your site visitors, such as language switches, uh, you can tell your site visitors that this post or this page or whatever is available in this language and this language. Uh, there's a little switcher, for example, you can put in your sidebar or you can have menu switches as well to show different languages that that page is being or that page is available in. Um, there's powerful translation tools to actually manage all your translations within the dashboard. So it's really easy to add, say, your French content and your Spanish content and etc. You can actually get access to professional translators through the WML plugin. W, there's, the, there's the main WPML plugin, plus they also have a number of other sort of add-ons that you can use as well for providing different functionality and stuff. Um, but one of the features with WPML is that you can actually you can actually liaise or get in contact with through the like, through the plugin itself. They can put you in touch with professional translators. So if you've got a blog or a a site that needs translating, through the WPML plugin, they can actually get you in touch with professional translators who can help with the translating. Obviously, there's a cost for this, but it might you might find it makes it a lot easier rather than having to try and find translators yourself. Uh, it's compatible with WooCommerce, as Brian mentioned earlier. Again, um, you know, a lot of people aren't going to want to buy a product in your online store if you know they can't understand the language. So, having this compatible with WooCommerce, which is probably probably the most popular popular e-commerce plugin at the moment, um, really makes it useful. And you can also translate your theme plugin text as well. Like a lot of plugins, when you activate it, you've got to do a little bit of configuring to set it up, but it is pretty easy. Uh, after you activate it, there's a little configure link you'll see on the actual main plugin underneath the, where it's activated or when, underneath the title. Click on that and it'll take you, take you through the configuration steps. First up, it just asks you what language the site is in or your main, your main language you want to use for your site. A lot of people, for a lot of people here, will obviously just be English. Next up, you want to tell it what languages that you're actually going to be using on your site. As I said, there's over 40 different languages this supports at the moment. Uh, and basically, you just tick whatever languages you plan on using on your site. And it will keep track of those. Next up is setting the language switcher options. Uh, this screen's actually a lot longer. It's been, I've cropped it off because it was too long, but there's a whole heap of options below this as well. Uh, you can tell, as I mentioned before, there's language switches which allow you to, or allow your visitors to switch between languages on your pages. Uh, you can tell it what sidebar, if you've got multiple sidebars on your site, you can tell it where to put the, the language switches, whether you only want one sidebar or multiple. Um, there's options in there to specify whether you want a little language switcher inserted into your menu automatically. Uh, you can have at the end of your 
at the end of your post or page content, you can actually have it come up with a little text to say, uh, this page is available in blah, 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 different, you know, list of different languages. There's a little switch you can have at the bottom of your footer of the, of the site, or well, gets put into the footer of your site. Again, to show you the different languages. And this is, as I said, this is all configurable in here. Um, a lot of the default options, or a lot of them are basically just, you, just, you can just keep it the default options. So it's, there's, as I said, there is quite a few options in, on the page itself, but you don't have to really, a lot of them you won't probably even bother in changing. When you're editing your actual content, you'll get this new language panel over in the right-hand side of your page or post editor screen. This is how, basically how you add in your new translated content. As you can see here, or, and, or as you would have seen on the previous screens, um, I selected French, German and Spanish for my site, test site that I've got up here. The main, you'll see over there, the main, I mean, the, sort of the main page, main editor, I'm just put in the English content over there. If you want to add in any of the other languages, basically just click on the little plus sign and it will actually open up a new editor page where you can copy and paste in or you know, paste in your new translated content. If you click the duplicate text box or checkbox, sorry, it'll actually duplicate that content into that post as well, but normally you'd probably just want to copy in the new content. So, for example, I've clicked on the little t the, the tick or the plus sign next to French. It pops up a new display or a new editor screen where you can simply just copy in your new French content. And you just do it for all the different languages that you've got. It's really, really easy to manage. When you're looking at your list of pages or posts, another, one of the things I really like about this as well, um, even though you've got different or multiple pages, so you might have, say, for example, um, I've got this page called Sample Page, and you might have an English version, a French version, a German version, a Spanish version. Um, it, only, it will only list the one page in your list of pages here or your list of posts if you're looking at posts. Um, but you'll have a column here to show which ones have actually been translated. Obviously, if there's a little pencil there, it means there's content there. If there's not, then there's nothing. So, for example, the, um, this line here, you can see that the, it's got the, the French and the Spanish translation, but doesn't, hasn't got the German. These are those uh, language switches that I was talking about. In the top right here, in, in the sidebar, there's basically a drop-down list, it shows you what language is available for that page. Uh, so you click on it and, as I said, it shows you a list of languages. You can, within that, uh, one of the configure, or within that settings page, you can actually configure what it displays in there, whether you want to display the little flag or whether you want to display just the word French or English or actually, you know, Francais or English or the actual translated word. Uh, at the bottom of the content, you can put in a little bit of text or you can have it put in a little bit of text that automatically tells you or tells the visitor that this page is available in all the different languages. You've got the footer switcher. Again, you can specify your different languages in the footer. I haven't got it here, but there's also one you can put, uh, automatically put on your menu as well. Um, WPML also allows you to manage your menus as well. So when you're looking at a... Um, the French page, for example, you'd most likely want to display a French menu. So <coughs> the, I haven't got the screen examples here, but the WPML plugin does actually, some of the different options in there do actually allow you to translate and set up different menus so they obviously display, you know, accordingly on the translated pages. When you switch, when you select something such as French, for example, then the page looks exactly the same, only in French content or whatever language you, want, you choose. 
you can only switch to languages that you actually have. So, for example, on this page, it's only translated into French and Spanish. So, they're the only options I get. So, you don't get a whole list of, if you've only got, or if you've got a couple of pages that don't have, actually have translations for them, then people don't get the choice to, to switch to them. It will only show you, it's smart enough to only show you the, the languages that are actually available. And just to finish off, here's some useful links. Um, there's some really good links on that translation, translating WordPress page in the codex. Um, there's some links to the translation blog and also about how you do translations such as the, the functions I mentioned earlier. Uh, there is, there's the official WordPress translations team blog, which is Polyglots, uh, WFML site, and also there's a handy quick start or getting started guide. So when you're first starting out with WFML, it's really useful. It gives you some good little hints about what it can do and um, some of the neat little features. Uh, there's also a really useful article on Toots Plus uh, that goes into or talks a bit more detail in regards to those functions that I mentioned earlier, such as underscore, underscore and underscore in and all that. So if you're actually developing theme, it's, it's quite a useful article and telling, telling you what you should be looking out for. If you're thinking about um, or wanting to get a, a theme up on the WordPress official theme directory, for example, um, then it needs to get, you need to have, or you need to, be, need to use these translation functions. So if you submit a theme and you're not using these translation functions, they'll basically come back to you and say, well, fix it up and use them. So even, when you, even if you're not trying to submit a theme up there, it's, it's a really good idea to get used to using these if you haven't been using them already. Um, especially, yeah, if you want to put it up there or if you want to actually sell the theme. And that's pretty much it. You can find me there um, if anyone has any questions. As I said, WFML, there's a lot of stuff that, um, that's pretty quick, a pretty quick look at WFML. Um, it's a good idea. Have, go to the site, have a look at what it can do. Um, there is a little bit more functionality than what I explained here. Uh, as I said, you can control menus and um, you can get access to translations, translators and all that sort of stuff as well. So um, it does have extra functionality than what I have just shown here. So it's, it's, and it is, as I said, when I, I know when I first started using it, um, I was quite surprised at actually how easy it was to just to set up a, a multilingual site and I was, ex, you know, I was expecting quite a bit of, expecting it to be a bit of a hassle but it was actually really, really easy. If anyone's got any questions, yep. Um, so my observation is that the language, if you're like, experienced in that stuff from that point on, you need that language. So if I've chosen to go to French and I've grabbed another page, am I still in French or does it just translate that single page? Um, yeah, if when you go to, so if you choose French on one page and then go to another page, it'll, it'll, it'll stay in French. Um, if it's, if it's not in French, then yeah, it'll just go back to, um, it'll go back to the English translation. Good question. I, uh, the question was, will it detect what language the visitor is sort of viewing their site in? Like, will it detect what country they're in? Um, I, Mm, not that I know of. It, it could be, I mean, I don't know absolutely everything about it. Um, so there might be something you could possibly do, but uh, to be honest, I, I haven't, it's not something that I've come across with it. So. From memory, we did do that um, a couple of years ago, but uh, it wasn't from like um, source of code to okay. detect and then. Uh, yeah, well, that's. I was going to say, yes, certainly another option, doing it, sort of, if it doesn't support it, then, yeah, doing a geolocation lookup or something and switching yourself or something.
cool. Thank you. Uh, that's another good question. Um, I'm pretty sure you do, yes. Yes, because it basically pops up when you go to, um, or when you select French, for example, to, to, for the French translation, it basically pops up a new edit screen. So, cool. Thanks. so how does, it, does it actually have separate database pages? It's magic. <laughs> it's just, just magic. Magic. So, um, to be honest, I haven't. It's something I was going to look into, but I just sort of ran out of time. I haven't actually looked at what it does in the database side of things, whether it's just adding stuff to WV content, um, or whether it's WV content meta or not. I'm not too sure, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I could certainly find out. So. Good question. If I could just go back to one of these pages, I think actually on the French. Um, well, first of all, this is the English page. So you'll see um, it's showing recent comments here and, oh sorry, recent posts and recent comments. Um, obviously these are English and that's English. When we go across to the French page, there's no recent um, recent comments in French and there's no archives. Um, the archives normally show you a list of posts. I, don't actually, I do have posts on this site but I didn't have an actually translated any. I just translated some, some pages um, and you can see there's only one French category. So yeah, it does sort of manage that as well So in you know, things like widgets and that sort of stuff so which is handy. Uh, yeah, there is, well, feel, feel free yeah, well, I was going to say, I, I did read up something the other day, but I can't remember exactly what it was I said that I read, sorry, um, something with, with regards to the SEO, so I would imagine, um, my, my guess is that, yeah, it would work fine. Um, but to be honest, yeah, you'd probably want to have a look into that. I'd be, I mean, I'd be surprised if, um, if, it, if Google picked it up as duplicate content, um, being on the, even, if, even though it's on the same site. Um, I would guess, you know, as I said, my guess is that they would have sort of, that's something they probably would have thought of. But again, you yeah, there's, there's actually a couple of, um, there's actually, there's actually a couple of, in one of the settings, or in that settings page, there's a couple of different ways you can, um, you can keep track of um, what it's looking at, whether it's looking at um, like a French page or your English page. Uh, one is by adding something onto the URL. Um, another one, I think, was using the mod rewrite um, functionality, and, and again, it depends what sort of, if your server can manage that or not. Um, there was, as I said, I think there was like three or four four different options to how it actually sort of manages that or, or tracks that, I should say. It's translated all the slides, basically. So each post, like it, um, that's the way it ends up structuring it. Okay. Sorry, could you say that again? Um, 
Yeah, or when, or it will only show you, so like, for example, if you've got page or if you've got content, or, sorry, start again. If your content isn't translated into French, then obviously it won't, it's not going to show that French content. Um, um, depending on, um, again, it, it's, it's not going to, well, I don't, from, from memory, I don't think it actually detects like where, where you actually are. So it's, it's going to be, you can probably default it, on, well, you can default it, obviously, you can specify the default language, um, what, what default language is that your, the site is using. Um, so it might be, for example, French is your default one and then English is the secondary one. Um, I don't know if that sort of answered your question or anything. The open graph stuff. Um, I'm not too sure on that. Sorry, I haven't. I didn't sort of look into the open graph stuff. I don't, couldn't. I didn't see any options within um, within the default um, WVML plugin. I know there, as I said, WVML sort of basically consists of about half a dozen different plugins. Um, there's this main one which does the sort of majority of your your functionality and your translation sort of services, if you like. Um, there's a few other ones for like translating um, string text in themes and stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure if there's something that would sort of manage that sort of stuff as well. Um, it'd be worth looking into. I'd so. Okay. Mm. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thanks.